Good afternoon. I, uh, I think we can say how we're very lucky, lucky we all are, to have two of the world's leading experts uh, on the law of free expression debate the question of hate speech. Uh, both Ronald Dworkin and Jeremy Walden are professors of both law and philosophy at a New York University. Ronald Dworkin was also for many years professor at Oxford University College London. Jeremy Waldron also now holds the Chichely professorship and is at All Soul Oxford. Now we know that countries throughout Europe have laws against hate speech. Laws that have been invoked uh, both for and against statements by and about uh, Muslim expressions. And we know that, uh, and Jeremy Walden, Jeremy Walden has written an entire book entitled <laughs> The Harm in Hate Speech arguing that laws against such speech can be both legitimate and justifiable. And we know that in the US, while Justice Holmes famously, and according to Jeremy, preposterously, said, you can't shout fire in a crowded theater. There is a long-standing American tradition uh, that protecting free and unrestricted and often vehement public discourse. And that Ronald Dworkin, in many books and articles, has one of, been one of that tradition's strongest defenders. Now, when retired Justice uh, Paul Stevens, John Paul Stevens, recently reviewed Jeremy's book, in the New York Review, he noted that the dean of the Harvard Law School praised Jeremy as one of the two or three greatest legal philosophers of our time. And that's a quote. And then, and then Justice Stevens added, and I quote, that high praise also applies to one of Waldron's former teachers, Ronald Dworkin who has criticized Waldron's writing on hate speech. Now, Jeremy and Ron will each talk for about 30 minutes, and, each, and then we will have questions. And uh, we will see what further discussion they would like. So, first, Jeremy Waldron, 30 minutes, then Ronnie afterward. Jeremy. Thank you very much. This really is going to be something different, partly because we're going to be focusing steadfastly on the, um, the free speech part of our topic. Um, I know there was um, discussion of free speech in Uni Wiccan's um, talk this morning, Fadima's, um, right of free speech. But for the next 90 minutes, we're going to focus on this very specific controversy about hate speech, free speech in a multicultural society. Can I begin with an anecdote? In 1978, I came to Oxford from New Zealand, where I grew up. And I used to hang around the courthouse. And one day, a man, I believe his name was Robert Ralph, he was a sort of a neo-Nazi figure in England. Uh, he was being prosecuted in the Oxford Crown Court, or whatever the name of the court was. He was being prosecuted for having pasted up all over a small town called Lemington Spa, pasted up posters depicting English men and women and children of African descent or Afro-Caribbean descent as apes and chimpanzees and gibbons. He'd put this stuff all over the streets, pasted up on the side of buildings. 
and he was arrested and charged under the provisions of what was then the Race Relations Act, which made it an offence. It said, a person who displays any written material which is threatening, abusive, or insulting is guilty of an offence if he intends thereby to stir up racial hatred. And racial hatred is defined as hatred in the community against a, the members of a particular racial group. So he was um, uh, charged under this, under this law. And he was convicted because the facts were not in doubt. There was a very, very ancient and crusty old English judge of the old school who you would have expected wouldn't have had much time for this newfangled legislation. But true to his job, the judge gave the defendant at sentencing a lecture. And I, I don't have it exactly in my memory, but it went like this. He didn't talk about multiculturalism because that wasn't a term used, I don't think, in 1978. But he said, how on earth do you think we are going to run a multiracial society in Britain if you are allowed to put up this filth uh, in the streets? How are we going to maintain social peace? How are we going to maintain reasonable equality and the basic rights of people if you are allowed to put up these posters? What were you thinking of? And he sentenced the man to a short term of imprisonment. There was some shouting from Robert Ralph's supporters in the public gallery, but that made a big impression on me. And it's that connection between the viability of a multiracial, multi-ethnic society. Whether we like the word multiculturalism or not, we live in societies now which are diverse as to culture, as to religion, as to ethnic background, and as to race. And somehow or another, we have to find a respectful way of working together. So as Bob said, a number of democracies have adopted laws that attempt to facilitate or protect this process of mutual respect um, by uh, prohibiting what we call hate speech. So in Norway, for example, as you know, section 135A of the Penal Code um, says that racist and other forms of hate speech become liable to criminal prosecution if such speech is directed against people from a minority background by virtue of their skin color, ethnic or national background, sexual orientation, or their uh, religion or belief. Germany. Uh, criminalizes attacks on the human dignity of others by insulting maliciously maligning or defaming segments of the population. And my own home country, where I lived until 1978, makes it an offense to use threatening, abusive, or insulting words likely to excite hostility against or to bring into contempt any group of persons on the ground of the color, race, or ethnic or national origins of that group of persons living in New Zealand, and it adds, or coming to New Zealand. Living in New Zealand or coming to New Zealand. And these laws exist not only in Norway and in New Zealand, but in Sweden and Denmark, France, Germany, the Netherlands, the United Kingdom and Ireland and Canada, in South Africa, Australia, and so on. They provide for moderate criminal penalties, and such uh, speech can be used as a reason for expelling somebody who has no right to remain in the country or for refusing entry for somebody coming into the country. And what I attempted to do in my book, The Harm in Hate Speech, was to try to give an account of what exactly motivates and justifies those laws. I mean, they are intensely controversial, as the next 90 minutes will demonstrate. But the idea is, I think, even to have a discussion about them, we need to understand the best that can be said in their favor. We need to understand, in a reasonably sophisticated and a detailed way, what harms they're trying to prevent and how it is that they're trying to prevent those harms, even if we decide, in the end, in favor of the position that I know Professor Dworkin uh, will want to um, advocate that free speech principles may be more important than the goals that such hate speech laws are trying to, trying to promote. My book is partly a work of advocacy, but mostly it's an attempt at understanding um, to try to see what these laws involve, because they are controversial in all countries. They're controversial in this country, and I know there have also been controversies about the um, unwillingness of the judiciary to uh, accept prosecutions under Section 135A in some high-profile 
cases. They're certainly controversial in the United States. Many Americans are horrified by the idea of hate speech laws, and I've received a number of hateful emails <laughs> that call me a dignity Nazi and a, and a totalitarian asshole. Um, people are very dismissive of these laws in the United States. Many people are. They're not sure how, that they, how they were supposed to work, how they would be drafted. And again, a point of my book was to try to show that this problem doesn't have to be faced for the first time. Th these laws have been drafted and amended, debated, and, and adopted uh, in most of the other advanced democracies. And there are debates in the United States, how could this possibly be reconciled with free speech, speech principles without hopelessly compromising our commitment to that universal ideal? And again, we need to see exactly how this difficulty or this challenge has been faced in the countries that have such laws. So it's controversial. Dworkin and I disagree about this in the United States, where there is a constitutional background that I think seriously uh, calls such laws into question. Uh, we disagree in the United Kingdom, where there is no such controversial background, and it's a matter of legislative judgment. Um, uh, and when I say it's controversial, I also want to emphasize, um, for those who have any interest in the US situation, that opposition to these laws in the United States is by no means monolithic or unanimous. Apart from the legal academy, which is definitely divided on the issue, there is division among our lawmakers. Not everyone in American state or municipal administrations is happy with the constitutional untouchability of racial racist leaflets in Chicago or Nazi banners in Skokie, Illinois or burning crosses in Virginia, not everyone thinks that lawmakers must be compelled to stand back and let this material take possession of their society. Indeed, in 1952, in a case arising out of Illinois called Bohane against Illinois, the Supreme Court actually upheld what we would now think of as a hate speech law and upheld the conviction of Joseph Bohane, who was the president, founder, and director of something called the White Circle League of America. And he had distributed leaflets on Chicago street corners, which had as their headline, preserve and protect white neighborhoods from the constant and continuous invasion, encroachment, and harassment of the Negroes. And it urged people, again, uh, quotation, to prevent the white race from being mongrelized by the rapes, robberies, guns, knives, and marijuana of the Negro. He was, he was charged under a, uh, 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 an ordinance in Illinois that made it an offense to publish or exhibit any writing or picture portraying the depravity, criminality, unchastity, or lack of virtue of a class of citizens of any race, color, creed, or religious belief. He was convicted by a jury, fined $200, and that conviction was upheld not only in the Illinois courts, but in the Supreme Court of the United States, albeit by a close majority of five votes to four. But the majority made a number of interesting observations. They said, Illinois did not have to look beyond her own borders, although they could, or await the tragic experience of the last three decades, remember this is 1952, to conclude that willful purveyors of falsehood concerning racial and religious groups promote strife and tend powerfully to obstruct the manifold adjustments required for free, ordered life in a metropolitan polyglot community. They tend powerfully to obstruct the manifold adjustments that are required for free, ordered life in a metropolitan polyglot, polyglot community. It's, again, just like that crusty judge in Oxford how do you think we are going to run a diverse society under these conditions? Another thing that happened in the Bohane case was that the phrase group defamation was used uh, by the court to um, justify upholding this law. And I noticed that Norway, in section 251 of, I think, the Penal Code, authorizes um, 
the public authorities to prosecute a defamatory statement that is directed against an indefinite group or large number of persons if that is required in the public interest, where somebody defames not a particular individual by saying his guns, knives, robberies, and marijuana threaten the public peace, but says anybody who looks like him, their guns, knives, marijuana threaten the public peace. As Justice Frankfurt has said in that case, a man's job and his educational opportunities and the dignity accorded him may depend as much on the reputation of the racial and religious group to which he belongs as on his own merits. This being so, said the judge, we are precluded from saying that speech which was concededly punishable when immediately directed at individuals cannot be outlawed if directed at groups with whose position and esteem in society this affiliated individual may be inextricably involved. That sentence has inextricable syntax, but the, <laughs> but the point is that individuals' ability to function in society depends not just on their individualized reputation, but on the general reputation and social standing of the group to which they are involved. And I'm sorry, I'm just bombarding you with cases, and I don't have PowerPoint, but um, there's a Canadian case, the Queen against Keegstra from 1990, in which Chief Justice Brian Dixon said this about the effect that public expressions of hatred, in this case, anti-Semitic hatred, may have on people's lives. He said, the derision, hostility, and abuse encouraged by hate propaganda have a severely negative impact on the individual's sense of self-worth and acceptance. This impact may cause target group members to take drastic measures in reaction. He didn't mean violent measures. He meant measures like, quote, perhaps avoiding activities which bring them into contact with non-group members or adopting attitudes and postures directed towards blending in with the majority. And he said such reactions by members of the targeted group would be most unfortunate in a society that celebrates its inclusiveness. So what I wanted to consider, and what I want to ask you just to think about, is the possibility that in a multicultural society, apart from the positions and policies and principles that Professor Appiah talked about in his um, discussion this morning, we also have to talk about the need to maintain something like a public good of inclusiveness, some general sense in the community sustained at a diffuse and implicit way that although we are diverse in our ethnicity, our race, our appearance, our religion, our sexuality, all of us are embarked on a grand experiment of living together. Each of us must accept that society is not for us alone, not even for the majority, but that it is at least for us too, along with all of the others, and each person, each member of each group should be able to go about their business with the assurance that they will not face hostility, violence, discrimination, or exclusion from others. And when this sense of assurance is conveyed effectively, diffusely, implicitly, as a public good, then it is something on which everyone can rely, a little bit like relying on the oxygen in the atmosphere or the quality of the water you drink from a public fountain. It's a, it's a public good. It's a public good to individuals, but it's a public good in the diffuse way it's provided and in the sense that it can't simply be provided by the state. It must be provided in some sense by the cooperation of, of everybody, and particularly for members of vulnerable minorities, minorities who in the recent past have been hated or despised by others within the society. The assurance abroad in the society offers a confirmation of their membership. They too are now members of the society in good standing. They have what it takes to interact on a straightforward basis with others around here. They are not to be treated as criminals or as animals. They are to interact on a straightforward basis with others in public, on the streets, in the shops, in business, and to be treated along with everyone else as proper objects of society's protection and society's concern. That element of basic social standing, which is the individualized side of this general assurance, I call dignity. Not dignity in the sense of a shimmering Kantian aura uh, surrounding uh, deep moral personhood, although that too is important, but dignity almost in the sense of just social standing, normative social standing of an ordinary person based on their ordinary self-presentation in society. And we know 
that the publication of hate speech, the pasting up of those posters in Leamington Spa, the distribution of that um, um, pamphlet in the streets of Chicago, the anti-Semitic ideas that were being taught by Mr. Keegstra in his high school are calculated to undermine that dignity of members of the affected group. Its aim is to compromise that dignity, both in their own eyes and in the eyes of other members of society, and it seeks, sets out to make the establishment and upholding of this broad public assurance much more difficult, much more difficult in the society. It conveys the message, don't be fooled by the fact that you are not excluded. Be afraid. Be afraid. It's important for you to remember that there are some of us, perhaps many of us, who regard you as animals or criminals or terrorists and so on. Take that message. I mean, I think we, we make a mistake when we think that the point of hate speech is just a hydraulic letting off steam or self-expression. It is usually speech aimed at a very particular social effect to make the business of upholding elementary dignity and the basic social good of assurance much more difficult than it would otherwise be, and perhaps to create an alternative or rival public good as the wolves call out to each other across the social peace of a decent society, calling out to other races, don't think you're alone. There are many of us who think like you, and if we can put this stuff about, we will be more effectively in a position to pursue discriminatory or violent policies. Frank Colin, who was the leader of the neo-Nazis who sought to march through Skokie, Illinois. I don't know why all this happens in Illinois, but uh, he, in, 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 in Skokie, Illinois, um, said, we want to reach the good people. We want to get the fierce anti-Semites who have to live among the Jews to come out of the woodwork and to stand up for themselves. So there's an attempt to construct a rival public good as well as to destroy the public good of assurance and dignity on which people rely. So it did seem to me to be important to articulate something. I mean, that's not, those are not simple ideas. They're reasonably complicated ideas. But I believe those complicated thoughts about dignity, assurance, and the provision of public goods and the responsibility, at least the negative responsibility that members of society have, which is not to make the provision of that public good more difficult than it already is in the fraught circumstances of a multicultural society. I thought it was important to articulate that in order to make sense of what good-hearted people seem to have done in promoting and sustaining this legislation um, over the years. And it was important also to perhaps keep under consideration keep under construction our sense of how to think about the limits on free speech, because free speech being a massively important principle, though on almost nobody's account is free speech absolute. People, decent people countenance restrictions on speech for fighting words, for threats, for incitement to mutiny or rebellion or to other serious criminality, for various forms of extreme obscenity, or child pornography. We have a, a general sense of certain outer limits of the free speech principle, which we justify in a certain way. And we have in mind not just specific limits, but the broad structural approach to how we think about the limits on free speech. And I believe it was part of what I wanted to say when I asked my question of Professor Appiah this morning, that although our notion of free speech's importance is a universal principle, and although I believe our sense of free speech's limits is a universal idea, it is very much a work in progress. It is very much a work in progress. It has been for the last hundred years. What I said was preposterous about Oliver Wendell Holmes when he was trying to articulate uh, the, the, the shouting fire in the crowded theater wasn't the image as such. The image actually comes from an incident in Calumet, Michigan in 1913 where some striking miners were organizing a Christmas party for their youngsters, and some provocateur, maybe or maybe not, an employer's spy, shouted fire in the crowded theater. I think 79 people were killed. Many of them were children. Um, and that incident was well known at the time and probably would have informed Justice Holmes's dictum. What was preposterous is not the idea. What was preposterous at that time was his equation of shouting fire in a crowded theater 
with opposition to military conscription uh, for the, for the uh, First World War, opposition particularly on grounds of the non-slavery provisions of the 13th Amendment. To say that such opposition is shouting fire seemed to me to be, to be wrong, but the, but the idea, we use images shouting fire in a crowded theater, fighting words. We use these images to convey our sense of how to think about this work in progress, our sense of the limits on um, free speech. And I want to use some of the points that I have made about the underlying values that apparently motivate hate speech laws just to reflect a little bit on structure of free speech limits. For many of us, the easiest cases for thinking about limits is when there is a direct link between speech and violence. Fighting words that lead to an eruption of actual fighting. Words that lead to disorder in the sense of violent acts. Incitements that actually say not just that uh, um, Englishmen of African descent are to be regarded as apes, but are to be exterminated as inhuman. We think we have no trouble understanding limits on free speech where there is a direct connection between the Speech Act and that particular form of harm. But maybe we need to be sophisticated in the way we think about harm. Because if I am right about this business of the relationship between generalized assurance in the social atmosphere and dignity, that is, the basic social standing, the ability to lead a life, do one's business, raise one's family in a multiracial society, then perhaps we might want to use some other imagery, not just the immediate onset of violence, but some concerns about, I don't know, environmental goods. We, all of us, in Norway, as I'm sure in the United States and in England, are required to fit to our automobiles emissions control devices, and we will face reasonably serious penalties for operating an automobile that doesn't have such devices. We're required to maintain them, to have them checked. We call it a smog check every two years or so in the United States. Not because the emissions from my car will actually cause anybody's death, but because the accumulated emissions from millions of vehicles and millions of trips will contribute to an atmosphere which is more toxic than we would like it to be. So we think about diffuse harms, not just particular harms. And we think about accumulating harms. We think about the growth of slow-acting poisons rather than immediately acting poisons. And it does seem to me, without wanting to undermine the free speech principle, it may be appropriate to consider whether the more sophisticated ways that we have of thinking about social harm in the case of environmental goods are completely out of place when we are thinking about the social environment or the social peace. Or when we are thinking about the causation of violence, perhaps we should think about the slow-acting causation of, of violence. When we are thinking about the causation of discrimination, we should think, think about the social conditions that nurture discrimination, bearing in mind another very important principle, that the government itself does not have the resources to protect people from discrimination or violence, except in a minority of cases, there are not enough cops to go around. Most laws, including these laws, rely on ordinary self-application of legal principles by individuals, by large numbers of individuals. The environmental laws rely on that, and I think the laws regarding social peace and mutual assurance rely on that as well. So I think it's very, very important to at least entertain the possibility. I'm a fallibilist about this. I may be wrong about this stuff, but I don't think that I'm wrong that it's appropriate to at least toy with these ideas and see, see where they lead us, particularly because we are dealing with a situation where such laws do exist, they have been sustained in almost all advanced democracies, and it is important, I think, to try to understand the intuitions and the thoughts that lie behind them. Bob, well, where am I on timing? Uh, another, another five minutes is good, because I wanted to end, this is sort of preemption, uh, with uh, indicating some propositions that I don't think we should be committed to in this regard. One is, 
although protecting people from the stirring up of racial hatred is important, I don't think it's important as a matter of law to protect people from offense, from being offended. Of course, racial hatred has a massive impact on self-esteem, makes people feel vulnerable, makes people feel unwanted, and that may have the closeting impact that Justice Dixon spoke about in that Canadian case that I mentioned. But the primary aim of hate speech laws is not to protect people's feelings, but to protect their social standing. Of course, an attack on one's social standing, a presentation of oneself as an animal or a criminal or a terrorist, a sign that says they are all called Osama, or a sign says they are all terrorists, referring to Muslim citizens. Of course, such an attack on the social standing of members of this vulnerable group will be experienced as painful and frightening, and there'll be a plethora of emotions, the anger, the shame, the desire to shield one's children from it, the weary sense of here we go again, uh, the, the sense of great distress, the, the fear lest this be associated with other forms of attack. After the events of September the 11th, 2001 in the United States, an awful lot of taxi cabs in the city began to display American flags on the back of their windshields, particularly ones with drivers who might be mistaken for Muslims. And I didn't see that as any grand, grand display of patriotism. That was a defensive measure. Yeah? Uh, please don't think of me uh, as a Muslim under the descriptions of Muslims that are currently circulating. We need to be attuned to those um, things as well. So any hateful attack on a person's social standing will have a psychological impact, but it's not the psychological impact that we're aiming at. It's the social standing that we're aiming to protect. And I do believe very strongly, and I do concede immediately to the critics of hate speech laws that it's a pity and it would be a mistake if such laws were drafted or interpreted so as to protect people from offense. I do believe it's very important that in law, in uh, recent legislation, for example, in Great Britain concerning r religious hatred, the, uh, the, uh, the law had, had a section added to it, probably under pressure from a number of its opponents, but that's the life of legislation. That's how legislation is drafted and redrafted. Nothing in this part of the act, having defined the offense of stirring up religious hatred, Nothing in this part of the Act shall be read or given effect to in a way which prohibits or restricts discussion, criticism, expressions of antipathy, dislike, ridicule, insult, or abuse of particular religions or the beliefs and practices of their adherents. And I think that qualification is very important. It drives a very strong wedge between an attack on the social standing, dignity, and self-assurance of the practitioners of the religion and an attack on the terms of their faith, which by vir simply by virtue of coexistence in a multiracial society, multi, excuse me, multi-religious society, there are going to be religious expressions that are necessarily hostile to each other's creeds, hostile to each other's views, and the way that the concepts, the substantiists and the transubstantiists in Anthony's presentation this morning um, illustrate. So I want to say that we should not confuse hate speech with offense, we should say that hate speech doesn't preclude criticism or satire. And so it, these, these uh, laws should not prohibit even the Danish cartoons, although the Danish cartoons, by virtue of the verbal context that surrounded them, came close to expressing a um, defamatory message to Muslims. I think um, that uh, Jutta indicated this yesterday. But here's the most important thing, and it's a response to something that Professor Wicken said this morning. It's tremendously important that hate speech laws not preclude the social investigation, the social criticism, and if need be, the protection of people from particular customs practiced among people that may be dangerous and criminal, such as protecting Fatima from her family's um, honor code. But I believe that by permitting generalized attacks on Muslim groups, we would make that process much more difficult.
because it is very important for the enforcement of these laws that the enforcement be discriminating as to individual offenses, discriminating as to individual criminality, even when that individual criminality does have a social or customary background, rather than simply permitting broad-based, scattershot, unjustified defamations on the whole population. Now, all of this sounds defensive, which is true. I am a little defensive about the proposals that I've been talking about today. I will almost certainly be more defensive after Professor Dworkin has, has spoken on this material. But I, I really just want to put this forward in the spirit of a line from the Godfather movies. Do me a favor, take this into consideration. 